You're listening to the Apple Insider Podcast. Welcome to episode 91 of the Apple Insider Podcast, where we discuss all things Apple, iPhone, iPad, Mac, and related and more. I'm Victor Marks, your host. Joining me is Mike Worthley of Apple Insider. Mike, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Uh, thanks for the invite for this week's podcast. New guy here, old voice in the industry. So uh, let, let's roll with that, I suppose. Yeah, glad to have you on board. So I want to open by letting all of our listeners know that they can grab the very lowest prices on iMacs and MacBooks with Apple Care, up to $430 off with exclusive coupons. That is, Apple Insider readers and listeners can use these coupons to score the lowest prices anywhere on 27-inch iMac 5Ks, 15-inch MacBook Pros, and the remaining 2015 12-inch MacBooks bundled with Apple Care. Uh, we have a list of these deals on our website. We're going to put them in the show notes. And Apple authorized reseller Adorama is exclusively offering Apple Insider readers and listeners these bonus savings on these popular MacBook configurations. Uh, it's, it's really a great deal, and I strongly encourage you, if you're in the market for a MacBook and need one right now, or need an iMac 5K right now, to consider these deals. And the reason why I say if you're in the market right now is because we have news. Isn't that right, Mike? We do indeed. A uh, new Apple event coming on Thursday, the 27th of October. Well, we don't know specifically what Apple's talking about, and they have not come out specifically and said that it is a Mac-oriented event. They never do. It's pretty clear what it is. Between the Hello Again, which Apple has used before, they used Hello for the original uh, Macintosh release in 1984. They used Hello Again for the IMAX return. And now Hello Again, again. And and that 1998 release uh, had Hello in the same cursive script as the first Mac and had Again in parentheses. Here, they're using the current system font, the San Francisco font, and just written hello again without any punctuation at all. Mm-hmm, that's correct. They, they also, there's a color splash on the Apple logo, which that can mean any number of things. Apple isn't known for just putting up a red herring on anything that they're doing for marketing pre-event. So they, I, they don't I, really give us hints, do they? <laughs> uh, they, they? They very lightly hint. I think this is either the a wide color display on an iMac, or they're just talking about different color finishes on aluminum, which are easily migrated over from iOS production. So, Well, you say that, but the anodization and the finishes on iDevice production have been slightly different than the finishes on the Mac line. They, yeah, they have changed the formulation. I think the use the, cases the gold demand... And rose gold aren't the same colors. Yeah, the, they, the, the, the different use cases of the, of the platforms demand different approaches. And that, that does have an effect on the final product. Yeah. So here, the, the color that you're referring to, I'm just going to describe it. It looks as if colors are being, let's say, projected onto smoke. And I'm seeing pink and reddish orange and a little bit of yellow and a little bit of green. It and struck, yeah, it struck me more as pigment in water. I'm, I'm thinking Halloween colors, though. OK, I could go with that. It makes right? sense for the season, right? Right. And that's as much divination as I'm going to give into it. But uh, the the event is going to be held at Apple's corporate headquarters at One Infinite Loop. The Spaceship Campus 2 is scheduled to open early next year. So this could be the very last media event held in the current headquarters. In all likelihood, it is. Based on the uh, the drone footage that we've seen, the auditorium is very near close to completion, even if the surroundings are not. But I've wondered if we're even going to have a whole lot of events in, in that setting. I mean, they built the auditorium, but they've been using the Bill Graham lately, and it holds many more people and is uh, probably a better uh, a better um, venue for, for these kinds of events, depending on how many people they're inviting. Also, the, the pre-construction diagram suggests that it's more of a theater in the round kind of approach in the new theater which I'm not sure is the best approach for a product reveal, but we'll see. We'll, we'll see what Apple has in mind. They obviously have something in mind. Uh, what it actually develops is another matter entirely often, however. Yeah, and especially with building and building plans. Frequently, you design a building, you design a space, and you know if you haven't planned it carefully, and even if you have, you wind up with a space that isn't nearly as usable as you originally thought. Yeah, it's, again, until we can actually get in there and take a look, and we will when we're invited to the next product <laughs> rollout. Uh, we, we really, unfortunately, Mike, you're going without being invited. Is it, that what's going to happen? We're just going to bust <laughs> down the door. Well, it's funny you should mention that because the Final Cut Pro uh, X or ten or whatever they want to call it Expo starts the day before. Let me see if I got my dates right. the The Final Cut Pro Expo 
the the warm up day is the day before with the event actually starting on the day of the reveal and the day after the reveal they're having they're invited to the campus for a tour for there's a final cut pro presentation and a, a brief from the apple product team whatever that turns out to be so a uh, good time to have the expo i suppose yeah well, and and Final Cut is is without. I, I didn't want to get too far away from from MacBooks and the announcement, but the Final Cut is is going through a bit of a, a popularity struggle. Let's say it used to be that all the movies and all the TV shows were produced with Final Cut, and then when Final Cut Ten or Final Cut X, as some people call it, uh, was introduced, there was a lot of noise about features having been removed, and a lot of people migrated to Adobe Premiere. Well, Apple's the feature thief, right? Apple will, like with photos, they did this with iPhoto to photos, where a lot of features from iPhoto were missing from photos, but they're slowly being added back in. So I do have faith that they will ultimately be restored. But Apple likes making sure that it's easy to do the, do it the way that they want you to do it. Well, yes, but the, the problem is that when you disrupt someone's workflow and that's their bread and butter, they find an alternative and stick with that and will stick with that for years. Oh, I'm certainly not saying that this isn't a problem because right. it very, very <laughs> clearly was a problem. And anytime Apple takes away functionality from users, even in the interest of advancing software, it, it can be a bit of a problem. And, and that's that's emphasized no more than in the iPhone jack removal. Yeah, it's a problem for some. It's a pro it's not a problem for others, but it's just one of the things that Apple does. Yes, but no one's depending upon their livelihood for the headphone jack. Uh, well, the uh, that's I'm not sure that's entirely the case. The, Where no one is, is a broad exaggeration. Uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> no one is. Yeah, never say everybody right. It's <laughs> uh, but yes, Apple does make changes that ultimately are a benefit but not necessarily in the short term. And let, let's just conclude that part of the conversation with that. Well, I'm going to segue out of that by saying one of the rumors that we've had for this event on the 27th is that we're getting new MacBook Pros and the new MacBook Pros are rumored to have what's called a, uh, a feature strip, right? Yes, the OLED feature strip at the top of above the keyboard replacing the, the existing function keys. And also rumored to have USB-C ports instead of the traditional USB-A port that we're used to. That I fully expect. I fully expect that we're going to see across the entire line that we're going to see the USB port. And bear with me on that for a minute. We're going to see the USB port across the entire line. Now, what those ports using the USB form, USB-C form factor are is another matter because Thunderbolt 3 also uses the same port the same physical port, if, if not it runs over that USB-C port, you can run USB 3 over the Thunderbolt. It would not surprise me if they said that the MacBook Air refresh that is rumored happens will have USB-C type 3 generation 2, meaning the, the full 10 gigabit per second speed instead of Thunderbolt 3 with the MacBook Pro versions having all Thunderbolt 3 ports. That wouldn't surprise me. The problem with mixing the same physicality of a connector on a computer with having two entirely different connection methods is it just doesn't strike me as an Apple thing to do. Well, USB-C, and, and people confuse whether it's the standard behind it or the connector, um, is, is a USB 3.1 connection, 3 connection, and Thunderbolt can run USB 3 signaling over its Thunderbolt port. So that the correct answer is you do Thunderbolt with a USB-C connector and have USB 3 as a byproduct. Well, it is. You get but, all of the things. Yeah, but the, the, the biggest problem with that is 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 implementation. It is, there's conflicting reports on whether Kaby Lake processors, which may or may not be in the new machines for many different reasons, have integrated Thunderbolt 3 support. And if they don't, then it's an, an entirely different chipset that needs to be added to the machine for Thunderbolt 3. All of this is is completely inconsequential because they've already decided and solved this problem six months ago and we're getting the <laughs> announcement on Thursday, that, right? That's true enough. That's true enough. Well, <laughs> the, the only question that, that we have is, are we getting an OLED feature strip instead of function row keys? And are we getting in a machine that has traditional rectangular USB ports that we're all familiar with? Or is it going to be consisting of only USB-C style ports? My guess, based on what we've been seeing from the supply chain, is the OLED strip will be included and it will be the USB-C style connector. All across the board. All across the board. I, I so, do not see any more 
USB A connectors, which is the rectangular connection connector, connector yeah. any in the lineup anymore. That's going to be a big change. Is there going to be a run on the last model? In which case, please use our deals. It, it, it's possible, and, and that's going to be aggravated a bit by the fact that Cabby Lake isn't necessarily any faster than Skylake. I mean, I, th- I think back and, and you realize that they still sell the one popular MacBook that has the optical drive in it because people want the optical drive. Are we going to have people who want to have the traditional USB-A connector? I, I think that there's an argument to be made for keeping it. I just don't think that Apple will. So will people still seek the old machines with the old connectors? Yeah, I believe they will. And as a reminder to existing users, your old hardware isn't going to burst into flames with a new Apple release. Oh, come on. As, as much as Cupertino might want that to happen. It's, well, no, actually, they probably don't, given the problems that Samsung's have had with it. <laughs> uh, that's true, I suppose. <laughs> that would be the last thing they'd want. But uh, so you wrote an article about supply chain and some of the sources that we have claiming these pair of MacBook mm-hmm. Pro models are coming, mm-hmm. right? So what did what did you write and what did Mako Takara claim? Mako Takara claimed that the 11-inch MacBook Air was going to be discontinued. And the 13-inch MacBook Air will be updated with new technologies. The the same report claimed that MagSafe 2 is a thing of the past and that the 13 and 15-inch MacBook Pros will see a refresh in next week's event. The As far as the specifics, it's hard to lean on the supply chain for specific hardware specifications, for, I guess. I, mean, I guess that's redundant because... Apple does as good of a job as obscuring these kind of things as possible. And given the shipment volumes between Macs and iOS devices, it's much easier for them to keep Mac details under wraps than it is for iOS. Could Apple pull a fast one on us and and have a MacBook Pro with USB-C and Thunderbolt 3 and USB-A connectors? Sure, they could. But that's just not what we're seeing. Rumors and supply chain leaks from, I want to say April, point to a USB-C only machine. And, and that's just backed up by the new reports from earlier this week. Right. Now, this this event, as far as, as what our sources tell us, this is specifically a mobile computing event, right? This is all about portable machines? It appears to be. I personally am leaning toward it being a wider refresh just based on the existing marketing materials for the invite. And some of the some of the Macs, not just the portables, are getting a little long in the tooth. You think? The, yeah, I, I, I would like to see a new Mac Pro, but I'm not holding my breath. I have pretty much entirely given up on the idea of a new Mac Mini. The the, the Mac Mini, it, it could be refreshed. There's not a compelling reason to do so. And it, I don't think it's ever going to go back to an upgradable machine like some of the fans are clamoring for. I think that Apple now considers the Mac Mini to be a bridge device for the iOS faithful to jump over to the Mac line. I do think that the main focus is going to be on portables. I do think that it's going to be a MacBook Pro focused event with the MacBook Air refresh being kind of an afterthought. Well, there's a valid question is what do you need a MacBook Air for if you have a 12 inch MacBook? That is a valid question. And the reports of a refresh on the MacBook Air are very new. We had anticipated that with the 12 inch MacBook being out that the 13 inch and 11 inch MacBook Airs would both be dropped. Mm -hmm. I don't have a good scenario other than if the 13-inch MacBook Air doesn't get Retina and doesn't get some of the niceties that the MacBook has. I mean, the, the only thing that is beneficial about the MacBook Air is that it has a little bit stronger of a processor than the MacBook gets currently. It does, but I think Apple's considering use cases on that. Mm. It, it's a tough argument. If you buy the MacBook Air because you want an ultra-portable machine that is lightweight and and goes anywhere, right? And has a decently long battery life. Then it's the same use case as they lay out for the 12-inch MacBook. You get a machine that has a long battery life and is lightweight. That's the issue here, right? Use cases. If the if the right. MacBook Air 13 still exists, then Apple sees a use case for it. Now, whether that's for the educational market, that's another matter. But the educational market is is largely all about iPads. Right. When when Apple sends quotes to schools for integration of Apple technologies, the the MacBook Air for the last couple of years has been a staple of it, where if it's an all iPad program, then the kids will get iPads and the teachers will get iPads and MacBook Airs. It's it's complex. The 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 nice, simple four matrix Apple product line hasn't been that simple in some time. 
and it again, it's going to be what Apple considers the use case for. And I think that they are going to give us that use case if the product exists in next week's lineup. All right. I think they will straight up say, and this is what we intend this machine for. Well, they, they used to be even more explicit and named it, right? You may remember the eMac, which was a G4 product with a CRT tube, and it was a Mac meant exactly for education. I, well, I do. I mean, I had one. They were they were as hard to handle as a greased pig, and they were impossible to service. But uh, the I'm not I'm just not sure. I would I believe the reports. I do believe that there is a 13 inch MacBook Air in the pipeline somewhere. But what it's destined for is the question. Like the the plastic MacBook, be, well before the MacBook renovation of last the, the year. The white MacBook, yeah. The white MacBook. The, Apple held on the books for the educational market for many years after they stopped selling it to the general public. In fact, I don't have an exact date handy, but I have, I saw a quote to a school from last October, from October 2015, that still included the white MacBook in it. So Interesting. Interesting. I don't imagine they were actually actively producing new ones. They they just had a bunch of back stock somewhere I'm, that they I'm, were pulling out of. Right? Yeah, I'm reasonably certain that they just had a pile of them left over because it was still a Core Two Duo machine. It was the it was the last iteration with the slightly redesigned external casing that they used. The the end of the Core Two Duo line. Yeah, which is still a 2010 machine essentially. Mm-hmm. Speaking about schools, Apple and IBM have, have been partnering for some time now. And Apple and IBM are introducing a a mobile first application for schools called Watson Element. Now, this is a story that Roger wrote on Apple Insider, and this this app represents their first joint app in the education arena. The the it's an interesting the whole IBM Apple partnership is fascinating. But the Watson element is designed, it's beyond just a tracking tool, but it also does more specific detailing on children, like keeping track of what they're interested in and what they've done, what behavior triggers they may have. And it's 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 a communal system, so any teacher in the system with pro- with appropriate permissions can see this data. It, it It's just a good tracking tool inside a school that it's just education is changing, and it, it's taking a more holistic approach instead of a warehousing approach in, in the last decade or 15 years or so. Holistic was exactly the word that I was going to use because this is a picture of the student in their totality, not just a picture, a window into their academic performance only. Or, right? how, you, you or can, how they behave in just social studies. or just Right. You, you can classes. add a note about a student's soccer match coming up or if someone got injured on recess or or other things that, that aren't directly related to things that happened in a specific teacher's classroom. Mm-hmm. And and see that across the board, right? Now, this this app is designed for the iPad, and it has hooks into IBM's web-based Watson and Lite, which is about lesson planning. Mm-hmm. So help, help me out here, because Watson as a label is all about AI. I do believe that this is still a predictive technology. I, I think that given the input from the teachers, which was, pre, which was previously limited to the teacher's break room, and gossip between teachers. I think that this is something that you can easily gain insights with the with the help of Watson into the system, into the children, and how to best approach the child's educational needs in the setting, as opposed to open your lesson plan and we're going to cover these four pages today. Right. So so the AI can suggest material tailored for the students' needs, like like taking a visual approach or something based on their hobbies or things like that. Is what, that... Watson Enlight is designed already to tailor an educational curriculum for the needs of a class. With Watson Element, it suggests – well, we don't have specific details in this. With, with the hooks into Watson Enlight, Watson Element tracking individual students' peculiars can help Enlight tailor this plan even more on a more granular level as opposed to an entire class level or in conjunction with an entire class level. All right. Well, this this Watson element is already in use in the, the Coppell Independent School District in Texas, and it looks like going forward, Apple is going to help it gain adoption as, as a part of its package for schools that they send out for quotes, right? Yeah, it, it does appear to be that way. It, it looks like that Apple will be including this by default as an option for the for the uh, classrooms. It'll be interesting to see over the next year exactly how much adoption this picks up. Right. Now, this isn't the first mobile first app. This is just the first mobile first app for education. Oh, no, there are there are so many vertical market uh, applications that Apple and IBM have developed together. And by vertical market, I mean, think of a particular industry and their specific needs. And that was the whole point of the Apple and IBM partnership 
is to introduce iOS and, and custom tailored applications across the industries, across education. This is just the first, this is just the, the first package geared for education between Enlight and Element. Right. And as I'm, I'm looking at it, you know, if I look at IBM's mobile first for iOS site, it, it starts out talking about enterprise insights and transforming the way that we work and, you know, and, and enabling professionals to interact, learn, connect and and perform better. They're talking about digital banking experiences for fostering lasting relationships. Um, they're, they're, they're talking about all kinds of different segments, energy and utilities, financial the whole thing. It's not a, yeah, it's it's not a big jump if you consider your students your customers. It's not a big jump to take the technology and use it in an educational setting to give a better experience to students the same way that Apple and IBM have been doing it for businesses and customers. Right. And in terms of education, that's kind of a shift because in the past we considered students to be a human resource. Right. I think in many cases they still are considered a human resource. I have a luxury of living in one of the richer counties in the country. And they, you. they, well, yes and no, right? I mean, there's, <laughs> there are ridiculous zoning requirements on things like my shed, for instance. But as a side effect, my children in the system have access to a number of different technologies and very customized and tailored education for their specific needs and desires in many cases, which I don't think that even 15 miles away outside of the DC metropolitan area that I would be able to get. And I would love every student to be able to receive a tailored education like my students are doing in the public school system here. And I think that this is a good way to go about doing that. Yeah. So the, the, I, the Apple and IBM partnership, as you said, it's kind of fascinating. They, they've also been internally deploying about 1,300 Macs per week. That makes IBM the largest enterprise using Macs in every regard. It, it's 100,000 Macs by the end of of 2016, beginning of 2017 in active use, just max. Well, they launched June 1st, 2015, and they, they deployed 90,000 max since that time. Mm-hmm. So far, they're on track to get to that 100,000 number. They've gotten 48,000 iPads out there and 81,000 iPhones out there. Which, which is an enormous number. It's 129,000 iOS devices. We don't have numbers based on how many new iOS devices they're deploying. But these are just staggering just, numbers. So, so think about it, right? What do you think the number is for their total worldwide macOS and iOS support staff? <laughs> this is such a great number. They have exactly 50. They have 50 people supporting 217,000 macOS and iOS devices. 50. <laughs> It blows me away. That That is, it's a combination of a couple different factors. It's a combination of intelligent device management. Uh, they're using the Jamf suite. It used to be, they used to be called uh, Casper for automatic imaging and deployment. So when somebody gets a new machine, IT doesn't have to spend an hour updating it and patching it, installing software and licensing. It's all handled by the Jamf suite. It's all handled automatically. User plops down the desk, user logs in, boom, done. It, it takes the time to download the software, automatically handles licensing. Device provisioning. The device provisioning, the whole nine yards from from a new sealed box. How much? How many you, How many listeners have worked in IT and have set up computers for users? Um, I don't know how many of our listeners have, I would, I would but I encourage them number. to respond and let us know. I, I think so. If you have a if you have an IT horror story, please do let us know. It's it, it's just when I got this report, I could not believe that it was fifty people. Well, so, you know what the first line in their script is, right? No, but I'm sure you're about to tell me. Yeah. Have you tried turning it on and off again? No. Well, yeah, that's always the first one, right? <laughs> I couldn't resist. I'm sorry. But uh, you know, when you when you think about it, there's there's no real numbers that we have on how many tech calls were given, but apparently 27% of the PC tickets generated required a desk side visit by IT staff, and only 5% of the Mac tickets required that personal assistance. Yeah, the, with eighty five thousand Max in the field, only three point two percent of the users need help. That's half of what it was when they first deployed their initial nine thousand. So and th- that's just a, a, a just a staggeringly low number. I've I've worked in IT support for a long time before a couple different writing gigs like led me to Apple Insider, and I I just I I blinked in disbelief at these numbers. But they are after some quick phone calls to IBM, they are completely and utterly legit. I just, it's staggering. These numbers are staggering. From an IT perspective here near DC, 
with uh, with commercial operations, I'm not even going to talk about government IT support. Nobody. But just looking at private operations is they want to have one IT person per 15 people. And those people are seriously heavily overworked. So 50 people for 217,000 devices? That I just, I can't, I, I can't even fathom that. But it's legit and it's Ladies happening. Ladies and gentlemen, Mike Worthley can't even. I, I can't. I, well, I'm not going to go that far. I, I, I like to complete my <laughs> sentences. But yeah, I, I can't fathom that. I just, I have, I have a seriously hard time wrapping my head around that low number. And, you know, obviously it's the right company to do it. It's IBM, right? Well, for, first of all, let's, let's take a moment and think about this. Many of IBM's employees are technically competent, at least in their fields, mm -hmm. or they would not have been hired, right? And additionally, the, the system as we know it is relatively easy to maintain and also relatively easy to administer. Certainly oh, yeah. things, things go wrong with Macs, but there's no, you know, we don't have some of the same problems that some of our Windows cousins share. We don't have a registry. We don't have other issues, whatever. This is certainly a top to bottom solution between the, the imaging, the automatic maintenance, between the, the mostly tech savvy staff. But you can't necessarily say that about an operation like IBM. Because you still have the you still have the human resources people, you still have other people not associated with that kind of thing that still have to be maintained as well, who would just as soon throw the machine at you as deal with the problem. No, but but I've oh okay. Secret. I, I worked at IBM from two thousand to two thousand two. Okay. And without exception, pretty much everyone that I met there was competent. Okay, Victor, we'll keep that between us. We'll make sure that, yeah, that no one else ever hears that. No one else ever knows that. Sure. But ever, there you go. When I worked at IBM, everyone was competent. Let's go with that. Well, that, that's good. Then we'll eliminate that <laughs> as a factor. But yeah. e but even so, just 50 people. And I keep hammering on that number, but it is so well, ludicrously low. Well, that's because low. it's staggering that, that you can support as many users as you do with that low a staff mm -hmm. count. But when you have, uh, as you say, all these other pieces in place, it really does make a difference. No, it absolutely. is absolutely a combination, like I was alluding to earlier, of the Apple hardware, the Jamf management software, the savvy users. It's absolutely a combination of those three things. And and frankly, going back to our original point about schools, is this is something that schools need to look more into also. Well, when I ran IT for a school, which I did years and years ago, um, I had Macs and I had PCs and I also had Linux machines and I kept a server with images of all the proper things and image and permissions and network login accounts and being able to re-image machine fast made all the difference. Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree. And, and that's been my experience and support as well. Uh, but too many organizations that you and I have probably both rolled into in the past just don't have that kind of organizational setup or or consider a computer to be an appliance and not something that needs any kind of preventative maintenance done on it. So, Well, so we, we it was a weird hybrid organization because it was a, a very much uh, by the bootstraps kind of school where where things were funded by uh, by by parents and by donations to the local community. And so we had we had a computer lab of Macs, which were iBooks at the time iBook G3. And we had a Mac server that did imaging and network login permissions for that. And then we had a Linux server that was um, handling network boot so that you had a bunch of dumb terminals that had no hard drives that PXE booted off of that. So you'd mm -hmm. log into a Linux screen. And that was the science lab. And we had uh, a smattering of Windows machines that were the personal property of teachers. And we supported those as well. Yeah, bring your own devices been a chronic problem for teachers for a very long time. I would like to see that end. Well, I I would have liked to have been able to have asked them all to PXE boot off of the Linux server and have bring their own machine, but network boot. But that's a, a typical problem. You can't do that because what you find is that people want to use the same technology at work as they do at home. Mm. You know, this is what killed OS2, if we go back in history to 1991, 1992. <laughs> Uh, OS2 had Win32s built into it so that you could run Windows 3.1 programs within OS2. And the big plan at that time, this was a partnership between IBM and Microsoft, was that people would run OS2 on computers at work and would run Windows 3.1 at home. And when they'd come into work, they'd be able to run the same software. And it worked great, except that Microsoft casually started breaking the Win32s compatibility over time, because what they found is that because workers wanted to run the same exact thing at work as they did at home, that Microsoft could break compatibility and push OS2 out, and they did. And there you have it, in almost 100 episodes, probably the first mention of OS2 ever. 
I, you know, we may have mentioned it once before. <laughs> <laughs> I got an OS2 Warp Connect was pretty cool, yo. Well, I, pretty cool, yo. That's <laughs> going, going back to the same terminology that was in heavy use time. when it was uh, when it was common. Yes. No, it was a great system. It really was. It had via voice built into it. It had dictation built into it. It had a lot of the things that, that we see coming back now, um, both with dictation in OS X and, and now Siri in OS X. It had some of those things way back then, and it just took this long to get back to it. Well, not to not to change the subject, but I'm going to change the subject. The the same Jamf people that do the device management for the, the IBM partnership also are working with a San Diego hospital, which and this having spent unfortunately a fair amount of time in hospitals in the last ten years, this I, I promise you is going to be revolutionary for patient care. What they're doing is they're giving patients iPads which they can connect to an Apple TV, which is connected to a large screen television inside the room where the dry erase board that nurses and doctors have been leaving data for patients and families on forever is replaced by this new system. It's a MyChart bedside application. A MyChart bedside application. That's right. And it, it's an amazing initiative because those dry erase boards get modified or not updated or somebody's butt erases a phone number or just any combination of terrible information passing. And it's not just that, but it's also communication, it's entertainment, it's because hospitals are full of boredom. It's five minutes of excitement followed by three hours and 55 minutes of sitting and waiting. Yes. and and But it's more than that because they've also gone ahead and put in home automation technology into the rooms so that you can personalize your TV right. and room settings using Crestron apps. And in, yeah, your environment, your windows, you name it, your lights. It, this is an amazing thing. And again, it's going to be one of those things that's going to appear here and there, but I would really like to see wider implementation of it, not just for personal reasons, although there are personal reasons. So so just looking through this, right, there's there's Jamf, which is handling the device management mm -hmm. through the Casper suite to wipe patient data from each iPad so that when one's discharged, you get a fresh iPad for the next customer. There's Epic, which is the electronic health record system, the EMR, which coordinates the iPad management with patient records so that the data is secured and compliant with HIPAA. And add on top of that is all the things that we know from Apple, which are the uh, the FaceTime and Apple TV and the rest of it. The The whole system, and there, there, are, other, there are other hardware considerations, like there are auto sterilization routines in place and things of that nature, not just data sterilization, but actual infection protocols in place. Right, you have to be well. handed a clean iPad. You can't be handled one that's going to get you sick. Right. I mean, so there's some behind the scenes stuff, but the whole thing is an integrated whole. It just communication in a hospital is just such a major problem. When does so-and-so come by? I don't know. Let me check the chart. They'll come back two hours later and say, well, they haven't come by. They'll come by in an hour. It's just such a major problem. And I'm not saying anything about the staff. I'm not saying anything about the doctors because there's just so much information that is presented to patients and staff on a minute to minute basis about so many different things going on that things get left behind. And I'm hoping that this will prevent that kind of thing from happening. Well, one of the, the common complaints that I hear from doctors a lot is that doctors have become um, data entry clerks. That, that you have to babysit yeah. the EMR and feed stuff into the EMR and that you don't have nearly as much time for actual doctoring as a result of having to babysit the data entry. I can see where that would be a problem. And the more of this that gets handled automatically, I think, is, is better for everybody. Well, my concern about automation is, is once something's automated, uh, is it easy to overlook? That's a concern. Another concern is getting an automated change fixed if there's a problem. I mean, obviously, this is should a I, new system. Should I bring up Therac 25? <laughs> do you know that story? I, I, I do, but I'm not sure our listeners do. Okay. Do you want to tell it or should I? No, you go ahead and do it. And I'll, I'll interject from time to time. Very good. That's how we'll go. So Therac 25 was a system for delivering radiation to patients. And it was the successor to a couple of other products also named Therac. And, and basically it was a, a partnership between a, a French developer and a, um, I believe an American developer. And basically what was, was that you could use the computer to deliver radiation much more precisely than you could the human setup, right? The setup time to position the patient and all of this. Well, they made Therac 25 so that you would get guidance for positioning the patient and setting everything up and be able to speed up the operation mm -hmm. and therefore spend less time on the human person attending the system. The problem was that you'd, you'd enter in as a human running the system, you'd enter in how much radiation was meant to be delivered. And 
if you backspaced over the entry and then typed again, it didn't actually delete the characters that you had backspaced and then thus would deliver the whole number several thousand times the strength of what you'd intended. And, and earlier versions of that also had a unit conversion problem. Uh, they, right. they eradicated that before it hit the public. But very last minute before they shipped, there, there are different units of measurement for radiation in use by, at the time, between the American medical establishment and the French medical establishment, which is what the hardware was based on in the first place. So that was an additional level of complexity, and it wasn't a one-to-one -one conversion. So it, it's, yes, it, going back to the original point, these things can be a problem and institutional issues could potentially be a problem. And this can't be, this kind of thing can't be implemented in a vacuum. You can't just drop hardware on, on, on an institutional environment like a school or a hospital and say, okay, this is how it works, go. There has to be training, there has to be education, and it has to be effective. The, the LA United School District suffered from that with their Apple-only deal. There was just no education. They just said, here's the hardware, run with it. And as long as this is maintained properly, and I have every reason to believe that it will be, I think that this will be a, a vast improvement on, on doctor and healthcare communication with patients and loved ones, which is important as well. Yes. Now, talking about people integrating devices properly into their, their workflow, because that's really what we're talking about is you can't just drop a, a piece of hardware in and expect people to have fit it within their curriculum or their workday or their systems. Let's talk about what happened with Patriots head coach Bill Belichick. <laughs> it's a good story, and not just because I'm a Patriots fan. Uh, so the NFL introduced a $400 million marketing deal with Microsoft. Microsoft doled out $400 million and hardware to the NFL for exclusive rights for the Surface to be the NFL tablet of choice on the sidelines. Well, in the very beginning, it was just humorous because announcers would call it an iPad-like tool that coaches and players were using, which well, is... first of all, it was a Surface 2. It's not even the good Surface. It, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of things that went wrong it's, with this. It's, it's the, not even their, their good hardware. And it's their, it, it, you know, it was the only thing worse would have been the Surface RT. <laughs> Uh, the, yeah, well, Surface RT, you and I will talk about in another podcast at some point doing a, doing, <laughs> doing a post-mortem of old dead technologies because Apple has their share of it as well. Yeah. But then coaches and players would start tossing them around like the old binders and headbutting them and things like that. And then there'd be connectivity problems. And then famously earlier this year in a playoff game with the Patriots, the communication system just broke down and the surfaces were no longer able to communicate with Wi-Fi. Right. Now, I want to point out at this point, moment that Microsoft has said that there is not a single thing wrong with any of the NFL surfaces, that nothing on the surface itself has failed. Ah, uh, yes, but we're getting to that. Go on. The biggest problem that has happened, according to Belichick and everything else we've read about it, is the hardware is owned and controlled not by the teams, not by the stadiums, but by the NFL itself. So a couple hours before the game, they get their communication, they get their radios, they get their surface, they get their surface carts and are told, here's your hardware. Have a good time. So they walk into the stadium and they're handed all the equipment and said, here you go. Have a game. Yeah. Not even in the days leading up to the game where some of the players are already there and, and doing sprints on the field and, and other assorted things. But no, a couple of hours before the game. They're the Patriots IT team and everybody else's IT team has got to pound their heads against this hardware, get it operating as best as they can and play the game. So I ask you, Mike. Yes. If you were a sound engineer, would you go to a arena and produce a show and rock up and expect to have a soundboard and a bunch of mics handed to you an hour before the show and say, here you go. Have fun. I don't even like using somebody else's computer. Right. So okay. why would I like so, using so somebody else's gear sight unseen? Would you expect to be handed an iPhone or uh, a Mac or even just a, you know, a PC and a projector and being said, hey, go ahead and plug in your presentation and project. Go, go ahead, man. You yeah, can do it. Is, yeah, it's ludicrous. What the NFL is doing with this hardware is ludicrous. Right. It's, I didn't realize it was that bad until the reports came out a little bit earlier this week. I had heard inklings that it was that bad, but All I didn't right. have All confirmation. Right. I'm going to stop you right here. I'm going to read what Belichick wrote. Yeah, please. It's a good – yeah, please don't take the five minutes that his whole tirade took. But you know. Oh, I'm doing it. <laughs> okay. You go, you go crazy. <laughs> Bear with me, guys. We're going to go for this. Let me get my hoodie on. One second. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> As you probably noticed, I'm done with tablets, Belichick said. 
They're just too undependable for me. I'm going to stick with pictures, which several of our other coaches do as well, because there just isn't enough consistency in the performance of the tablets. I just can't take it anymore. The other communication systems involve the press box to the coaches on the field and the coach on the field, the signal caller, to the coach quarterback, coach signal caller system. And those fail on a regular basis. There are very few games we play, home or away, day, night, cold, hot, preseason, regular season, postseason. It doesn't make any difference. There are very few games where there aren't issues in some form or fashion with that equipment. And again, there's a lot of equipment involved, too. There's headsets in the helmets. There's the belt pack, that communication. There's a hookup or a connection to an internet service or that process and so forth with the coaches in the press box. There's a number of pieces of equipment. There's a number of connections. They're on different frequencies. Again, not that I'd know anything about this, but it's been explained to me. There's a lot of things involved, and inevitably something goes wrong somewhere at some point in time. I would say weekly we have to deal with something. Dan Famosi is our IT person. He does a great job of handling these things. This is all league equipment, so we don't have it. We use it, but it isn't like we have the equipment during the week and we can work with it and say, okay, this is a problem. Let's fix this, or that's not how it works. We get the equipment the day of the game, or not the day of the game, a few hours before the game. We test it, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Usually by game time, it is working, but I would say not always. And then during the game, sometimes something happens and it has to be fixed. And first of all, you have to figure out what the problem is. Is it his battery? Is it the helmet? Is it the coach's pack? Is it the battery on the coach's pack? It could be one of these 15 different things. So I just say there are problems in every game. There are problems last week, but there are problems the week before that too. Some are worse than others. Sometimes both teams have them. Sometimes one team has them. The other team doesn't have them. The equity rule that's involved there on certain aspects of the communication system, but not on all aspects, meaning what happens on one side, then the other team has to have the same. If ours are down, then theirs have to be down and vice versa. But that's only true in certain aspects of the communication system, not everything. Overall, there's a lot of complexity to the technology. There's a lot of complexity to the multiple systems. And I know on our end, Dan does a great job to fix those as quickly as possible, but he has very limited access. I don't know how much urgency there is on the other part from the league standpoint, how much urgency there is for them to have everything right. I don't know. I'm not involved with that. But yeah, it was a problem last week. It's basically a problem every week. The degrees aren't the same, but we're usually dealing with something. As far as the tablet goes, there was an experiment in a couple of preseason games. It was one preseason game. We had two because it was our home game in Carolina's home game where we had video on the tablets. But for me personally, it's a personal decision. I'm done with them. I'll use the paper pictures from here on because I have just given it my best shot. I've tried to work through the process, but it just doesn't work for me. And that's because there's no consistency to it. Long answer to a short question. Sorry. So now that I've read that. Way less right, than five minutes. Good job. Thank you. The The issue is they don't even have control over troubleshooting. They get it. And it's not parity between what their disabilities are and the other team's disabilities are. Yeah, not necessarily. Right. There, there are there are some rules like quarterback communication headsets that do require parity, but not everything. Like for instance, when the Patriots' hardware went down during the playoff game last year, the other team wasn't required to turn off their surfaces and, to accommodate the problem. It's just the game went on. So, I, I would say. There are a couple of issues here. One of them is the complexity of the system. There are too many moving parts. I, I agree with right? that. It's. I'm curious what your number two is because I think there may be three here. Okay. It's entirely possible there's more than three, but I would start by saying complexity of the system. There are too many moving parts for consistency to be guaranteed. Okay. I would say that the lack of access that IT people have to the hardware is an issue because the, the NFL clearly has an IT person on this. Right, the league has an IT people, IT group handling these, but that IT group is disconnected from the coaches who are having the issues. Yep, I'll go with that as the number two. Right, so so you've got a support organization that is not responsible to the people having the problem. With that kind of a disconnect, none of the problems are motivated to be fixed. There, there's no motivation to fix those things. Yeah, that makes sense. Number three for me is I think that some of this is the old guard talking. I think that this is how it's always been. So this is how it's always going to be is a consideration here in some respect. Who is, who is the old guard? Is the old guard Belichick saying, screw it, he's going back to his photos? Or is the old guard the league saying, we're giving you the equipment, you'll take it? I think yes. I, th- I think that both of those can be considered as part of the old guard. The NFL, I, the NFL is I used to doling crap that. out like that. Yeah, Yes, they are. But I dismiss half of that because I, I got to say, Belichick gave it a real try. He did. Oh, yeah, he did. You, you cannot say that he's the old guard and being an old fuddy-duddy and saying, screw this technology, because by God, he's tried to do it for how many games and there's always been something that's not worked properly. I'm also not sure that he had a choice in the matter. Um, It was pushed upon him. Fine. But the, the fact remains, did he use it? Did he attempt to use yeah. it? Can he, he point out the all the problems that they've oh, yeah. had? 
Oh, yeah. Okay, if he can point out every problem that he's had with it, then even if he didn't like it, it wasn't like he just said, yeah, yeah, I'll take it, and then shoved it in his pocket and ignored it. They actually tried to use it. He knows all of the different problems with it. He's been talked through the complexity of the system. And he supports his IT guy. He, he names his IT person and talks about what a great job he does and how it can't be his fault because the league won't let them handle it. Can you even imagine the frustration of that guy every day? That, uh, the, I, I know that right now after having read this, that if I'm that guy, I'm feeling pretty good knowing that someone's supporting me. Yeah, well, the support is good, but knowing that on Sunday your day is going to be terrible because you're handed a, a half-broken pile of equipment. Yeah, that's not happy. You know, here's the thing. This program could have been managed better. Major League Baseball has a deal with Apple. (laughs) Major League Baseball has a deal with Apple for iPad Pros, given their recent extension of digital technology rules in the dugout. And nobody's complaining about it. Terry Francona on the Indians, he loves his. He's, okay, but he's but, spoken but, to the press says it's great. But the the primary difference here is not the Apple hardware. The primary difference is that the club's hard. It's the club's hardware. It travels with the club. Well, that's part of it. The other part is is complexity reduction, right? They they know all the different moving parts in the system, right. and it's not just that it's the clubs to manage. It's that they have probably reduced complexity between those parts. Well, I think so too. It, it also, I think that I think that the during the game need for communications is less, which is one less moving part. Like the the coach is giving hand signals to his pitcher; he's not talking in his ear on a radio communication. So I, I think that baseball has fewer moving parts in that regard. Uh, but I, I think I just think that the key is because the, the teams have control of the hardware. Yeah. P- people, when they're selecting systems, will sometimes go shopping on the Internet and buy a bunch of disparate things that don't necessarily work together. The other thing that they'll do is they'll pick what seems like the very flashiest idea as opposed to the very most reliable idea. You okay. know, you can use an analog radio and it works great. You don't have to do VoIP over an internet connection. <laughs> well, right? I, I actually have a similar parable. I'm shifting to four, a 4K workflow in my office here. And I had a combination of switches and signal injectors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I wised up one day and just said, well, Jesus, a stereo receiver with 4K makes more sense. So those four plugs are extracted in the place of a stereo receiver now, which works better in every regard instead of my mishmashed solution. Mm-hmm. And it's it's the same basic concept. I didn't consider the overall use case and necessarily the best solution. I considered a solution based on existing technologies that I knew, and it just wasn't necessarily the best. There you go, Mike. Mike Worthley, ladies and gentlemen, always in pursuit of the best. You no, know, you, you do what you got to do in this job, you know? Yeah. Now, Apple has been getting beaten up in the press lately, especially the tech press, about its approach to artificial intelligence. And... You know what? Instead of me reciting the complaint, you tell me, Mike, what's what's the complaint that people are having? Well, the biggest complaint is that Apple's behind and the series implementation is haphazard and incomplete. Why do people suspect that they're behind? Well, it's a couple different things is Siri isn't a homegrown solution. Siri was bought from the same people that made Viv that Samsung just bought. So, yeah, but but Siri used to do a lot more before Apple crippled her. Crippled her. It, it did. Apple has, in this case, I believe, and the media believes, and most criticism of Apple is that Apple is self-interested in technology and is trying to drive Apple's implementation and Apple's idea as this is, like I said earlier in the podcast, this is how you're going to do it and this is how you're going to like it. Yeah, but... One of the things that I keep seeing coming up is that Apple's approach to privacy and having privacy SARS that mm-hmm. can shut things down is the leading reason as to why Apple's behind an AI. I, I can believe that, but I we'll we'll debate that some other day. I, I think that I think that Apple uses that as an excuse sometimes. While I do agree that there are privacy implications of Apple stored more user data than it does it's a tight walk. It's a tightrope that they walk and we walk as consumers for privacy. Okay. So the big news here. Yes. The big news anyway. The big news is that Apple hired a Carnegie Mellon artificial intelligence researcher to work on Apple's AI tech. So Russ, uh, and I'm going to mispronounce this name for you. Russ Selakudinov. I don't know. That sounds pretty good. Is joining Apple to direct some of the country, company's efforts in the field. And he, adju- he announced his job on Twitter, which is also a unique thing because in the past, people didn't used to announce that they worked for Apple. 
we yeah we normally need to get these these little tidbits of new hires by Apple. We have to pour through LinkedIn profiles and things of that nature to figure it out. But yeah, he just full on announced it. The guy has worked at MIT, the University of Toronto, and he's a neural network specialist. He's worked for Google. He, he's done research funded by Microsoft and Samsung. The the guy is a rock star in the field. And it's just one in a line of hires. And he, they, he, they, Apple's bought other companies that specialize in artificial intelligence. Uh, the new Japanese research and development facility that they just spoke about earlier this hey, week. Hey, I was getting to that. Oh, I was okay. getting to that. <laughs> well, you can, you can detail that if you'd like. It's just, <laughs> it's a big push and it's a big push for everybody. It's a big push for Google. It's a big push for Microsoft and Apple. Yeah. And, and Tim Cook makes no bones about it. He's, he's said openly in, I think it was a Bloomberg article not too long ago that, Artificial intelligence is a part of everything Apple does now, that just as privacy is everywhere for them, that artificial intelligence is a part of every group. It's it's a burgeoning field. I think that down here in the trenches and the typical AI podcast listener, we're passingly familiar with it. I think that the mainstream press and audience will become more aware of it beyond just the Cylons from Battlestar Galactic kind of thing or Terminator or something like that. And I think that there are going to have to be more discussions about artificial intelligence role in humanity's future. And this is where it starts. It starts with a simple, easy to understand interface tacked on your smartphone that Joe public can use and understand before we have to tackle some of the headier issues involving it, like the ethics of artificial intelligence and automated cars. So we are, no, we are now app, as you mentioned, there is a Japanese research and development center and Tim Cooks says that it's it's set up to build a very different artificial intelligence kind of technology. Uh, he won't tell you the specifics. The specific work is very different, he said in an interview with Nikkei. And, and basically what he says is that he sees that Apple's AI tech is going to run across all the products in ways people don't even think about. Uh, he's talking about improving battery life, recommending music, and remembering where you parked your car. Well, some of that we've already got, right? We've got music recommendations. We've got remembering where you parked your car because Maps intelligently records where you've parked your car and lets you know how to get back to it as a notification kind of thing. Um, and the the improving battery life is a good one because currently you have a very binary kind of choice, right? You have, uh, you know, you have the the low battery mode and you have full on. Right. But if you can intelligently do something by analyzing what applications are drawing the most and being careful about it. Right. Well, a prime example then, that is monitoring user habits. Conservative. If, if the if the AI can figure out what the user is doing at any given part of the day, it can proactively make choices on what needs to be running and what doesn't just based on what the user likes to see and what when the user does it. Thank you. And, you know, furthermore, what you can do with that is is it, this this reflects on the privacy policy from Apple, right? Their privacy policy has been one that they – if they can, they don't want to collect information and keep it in the cloud. Mm -hmm. But by keeping that information on the phone, right, that analysis on the phone and doing that analysis on the phone, then there's no problem. Yeah, shunting the heavy lifting with non-user identifiable hallmarks – is is right now is the key to that. But if smartphone evolution continues at the same pace that it's continuing, it won't that won't be necessary for that much longer. And that that may be what Cook's alluding to, or it may not be. Right now, Siri and Microsoft's Cortana and Google's assistance and Amazon's assistance are all run from huge server farms where they where they pass queries back and forth from devices. And Apple takes a different approach to it than the other ones do. Whereas if the product is free, you are the product. That yeah. somebody's trying to well, say. and and you know this is one of the things that a lot of the AI researchers have been talking about online is that if you don't collect the data, then they don't have a large enough data set to work with. Is their feeling, and that's partly why they don't think of Apple as being an attractive place to work. Um, this this researcher joining Apple is interesting because of that, because you know it's if if it shows that Apple's approach does work and does make sense, then perhaps Apple will have an easier time acquiring more talent. I'm not a coder. I'm not a developer. Haven't been in many, many years. I haven't touched no. a line of code in decades. Wow. The but looking at the looking at the researcher's work that he hired, he's got an entire differently topographic approach to neural networks that appear at first glance to be more able to be shoehorned on a smaller capacity device than a server farm. And if that's where they're going, I'm I'm all in for that. If if you can keep all of your data on your phone and your phone deals with the crunching, yeah, I'll I'll take that in a minute 
over other solutions. Excellent. Well, the Research and Development Center is going to be in Yokohama, and it will be completed in December. And Cook vows to use its local presence to forge partnerships with Japanese companies. They they paid to take over this part of a Panasonic factory in uh, Tsunoshima Higashi, a space that was measuring over 269,000 square feet. And they're going to go ahead and green that facility as well. They're going to use recycled water and trees planted on the roof and cool things like that that they do to be independent and self-sufficient. Isn't it nice not to have to be the voice of the resistance anymore, Victor? Chase, tell you what, it's good to be on the uh, top of the hill. Mike, Mike, I was never the voice of the resistance. <laughs> and Don't tell anybody that I was. Okay, we'll keep that between us again. Thank you. <laughs> well, Mike, we've come to the end of another perfectly good podcast. Is there anything else you'd like to discuss? Well, next week's going to be a, next week's going to be a big one. Uh, the Apple event going to be huge. There's going to be a lot of talk about that. There's a Microsoft event in the same week and Apple quarterly results. So, uh, man, this week, even as busy as it was, is slow compared to what we're going to see in the next couple of weeks. Excellent. Mike Worthley, ladies and gentlemen, where can people find you on the internet? Oh, geez. The best place to find me is on Apple Insider. I'm also at Mike underscore Worthley at Twitter. No one's ever going to be able to spell that. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, if you find me an Apple Insider, I'm, I usually work during the day. If you find my byline, you can you can figure out how to spell my uh, my Twitter name from there. How about that? Wonderful. All right. Well, if if Mike talks about zoning regulations and his shed in the upscale neighborhood next week, we'll hear you all about it on the Apple Insider podcast. Well, yeah, the shed's not changing, so I won't hear about that. <laughs> right.